All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Community Affairs with the Dallas Area Chamber on this fine, sunny morning as we're all trying to dodge the sunlight coming through the windows. Um, today, our guest is Tanya Brumley with the uh, Community Affairs Manager for Northwest Natural, and then Nina Carlson will be joining us. She is with the Public Affairs Consultant for Northwest Natural, so we'll be getting a little bit of that, and they do have a presentation for us. But before we begin, let's go around the room and we'll introduce yourself, and if there's anything that's going on, you have to keep it to a small sound bite. Um, and then also, if there's more information that we need, throw it into the chat so that each of us can grab that. And I'm going to start with Mr. David Peters. Good morning, everybody. Dave Peters, Columbia Cascade Housing, the Columbia Housing Authority. Um, update on the down payment funds of the half million we got for first generation home buyers. We've already um, allocated, whatever you want to call it, over just around 300,000 of it. So it's going pretty fast, but um, it's it's a grant. So it's kind of fun to, to get those funds out to first time home buyers that are also the first in their family, at least recent family, to own a house. So we're doing moving forward. Thanks. It's a great program. Thank you. Mr. Dan Spots. Thank you, Lisa. Dan Spots, Columbia Gorge Community College. I did put in the chat box the uh, public forum date and locations for the four uh, college presidential finalists uh, coming up uh, starting next week and other uh, events. Uh, 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 Senate Bill 482 regarding uh, safeguarding uh, our college aviation technology training program taking place at uh, uh, Dallasport, where we can receive state funding to support that. That is awaiting the governor's signature. So that is uh, moving along. And uh, um, we've been keeping a close eye on the federal debt ceiling negotiations. As you know, we have federal funding, ARPA dollars allocated by our state lawmakers. We are receiving reassurance um, from uh, Senate staff that those funds are not likely to be clawed back. You may see that term in uh, the news reports, um, but we are still keeping our fingers crossed. Apparently, the funds allocated through the states, through state lawmakers, there are so many in so many different um, circumstances that it would create quite a political mess to try to bring all of those back into the federal budget. So uh, we're hoping that uh, our own funding, preponderance of which would be dedicated to a public child care center, as well as aviation technology training, or not aviation tech, but rather uh, agricultural tech program uh, and a couple of other uh, uh, initiatives at the college, we hope those are going to be safeguarded. So keep your fingers crossed. Awesome. Thank you. Scott McKay. Good morning, Lisa, everyone. Scott McKay, Community Liaison for Circles of Care. And like I always say, we're always looking for volunteers. The uh, One other thing is that there is a getting to know dementia class the second session of the six-week session is being held at the Mid-Columbia Senior Center. And I don't think anyone in this group probably can attend it because you all work, but it's a fantastic class. Ronnie Hyde is leading the class, and she's a greater um, old adult behavioral specialist for GOBI, Greater Oregon Behavioral yeah. Health Inc. And so I, if you know anyone who might be interested in the issue, uh, many of us are have connections with um, an old adult who may have dementia. It's a great class to learn more about it. And today's session is about how the brain changes. Thank you. Great. Well, we'll just move right over to Rob Garrett. I can push all the buttons until the right one comes on, right? Yeah, I just wanted to reemphasize what Scott has going here today at the center. We had, I don't know, Scott, what, 20 people last week? It's a pretty good amount of people in the room. So it's kind of cool to see that many people show up for a class. It is a very exciting thing. Other than that, we have the normal activities at the senior center here in the Dalles. And uh, that would include, you know, the bingo, of course, tonight and Saturday night, as well as all of the fun stuff we do throughout the day. Tom Graff plays music today at 11. If you know anybody who would enjoy just coming here and hanging out, uh, this place is where it's happening, especially through the midday. So come on down. Thanks, guys. All right. Travis Dre. Uh, good morning, everybody. Travis Dre, Director of Business Development for Mid Columbia Medical Center. Uh, I'm going to paste a or copy a, a YouTube video into our chat. It is our uh, it's regarding our 2022 SOMOS program, our serving um, organ. Uh, 
serving Oregon and its migrants by offering solutions. Uh, our This program run by Amy Sog and Jasmine Julia Flores and Selene Maldonado received the 2023 Rural Health Award for Outstanding Rural Health Program. Uh, it is really remarkable to be nationally recognized for a program that MCMC has been doing since 2017. Granted, uh, the pandemic had some influence on uh, the success of, of a few years, but Jasmine and Amy and team were able to take it to a whole nother level and actually expand the reach and really put together some solid programming that was super engaging for our community. So I'll put this in the chat and uh, really proud of that team. If you know any one of those individuals, uh, please congratulate them. Thank you. Corliss Marsh. Good morning, everyone. Corliss Marsh with Habitat for Humanity. I'm the senior center in the library. We had a wonderful uh, dedication of a home a couple weekends ago. It was just great to see a new family with three kids moving in on 13th and Kelly. Awesome. Love it. You said 13th and Kelly, right? 13th and Kelly. Okay. Sue Davis, welcome. Good morning. My name is Sue Davis and I joined the Columbia Gorge Community College as the director of their foundation. I replaced Wendy Patton and I, I started on April 24th. I'm still in startup mode right now, but I'm so glad to see you all and looking forward to working with this group. I had a great meeting with Lisa recently and she kind of oriented me a little bit about some of the work you all are doing. So what's happening at the foundation currently is that we just concluded awarding $180,000 to about 70, actually about 80 students for the 23-24 academic year. That represented about half of our applicants for our funds. So about half the students who put in are now reaching out saying, hey, I need this funding and how can you help me find other funding? So that's that's another project that we're looking at now. We also have a whole financial aid office at the college, but kind of working um, hand in hand there. We have a golf tournament coming up, the Founders Cup Golf Tournament, September 9th. I'd love to invite you all to come join us and play golf with us or volunteer if that's of interest and would be happy to send information out to you all. And then the last thing I'll say just right now is that we will be at the farmer's market, the Dallas farmer's market um, on June 10th. So look for our table there. Corliss will be joining me and we'll have information on the foundation and the college and just we'll be excited to join a community event. So that's my report for today, thanks. Great, thank you. Matt Cole? Good morning, Matt Cole here, direct line IT. Um, <clears throat> always with the cybersecurity stuff. Um, like I said before, we're doing a lot of phone systems here lately. Uh, one thing I was thinking of this morning, just as an FYI to businesses, that uh, Server 2012 R2, which has been around forever now, is end of life coming in October. So that's a huge deal because it either means people are going to have to um, completely replace their server or potentially look at upgrades. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out. Thanks. Casey Cook. After she unmutes herself. She might have ran, she's got little ones. So she might be doing that. We'll let her put her intro into, oh, she says this, the kids are loud right now. So she's going to, Casey, just put your info of who you are and what you do um, in the chat. So we all have that. Um, and maybe with uh, your, at least your email, so we can reach out if anybody wants to. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Tanya Brumley and Nina Carlson. Uh, so with Northwest Natural, as they have a presentation for you, and we will try to have some time at the end for some Q&A, and we will just take there. And so go ahead, Tanya and Nina. Welcome. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, you guys can hear me okay? 
Yeah. Okay. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been on here. So thank you, um, Tanya Bromley. As you, I think I know pretty much everyone on here, uh, Northwest Natural. And so today uh, we're going to give you guys a presentation about uh, what's going on in the energy industry as it pertains to natural gas. So I know this will be a riveting presentation for all of you. And uh, because the person who does this best is Nina, so I suggested that uh, Nina come on over and join us. And um, she was even willing to drive down to the gorge. She's out of our metro area. But uh, I told her it was great. She could just zoom in because this is all we do is zoom uh, for this particular meeting. So I'm super excited to have Nina. Um, She's our government and public affairs uh, specialist down in the metro area, as I said. And so, uh, Nina, did you want to introduce yourself before we get this slideshow on or have anything to say prior to this? Well, I just wanted to say thank you guys for having us. Uh, hopefully, we'll, you'll come away knowing a little bit more about your energy system and you won't need that third cup of coffee. But with that, Tanya, let's go. All right. Yeah, get ready. Get your get yourself prepared this is going to be one heck of a show uh, okay lisa you've got you've got the powerpoint so if you want to present uh you're muted yep give me just a minute and i will get that up okay and i think if you guys have questions throughout this feel free to just ask them as we go along um and we'll just kind of deal with it as we go it it should it should take up pretty much the yeah, probably half an hour, maybe, I think, to go go through these slides. Uh, nine is pretty quick. But okay. don't let us be too quick if uh, you have questions, just interrupt. And Tanya, I'd ask you, you would, uh, if you would monitor the chat, but folks, feel free just to shout out. Uh, this is very informal. Uh, yeah, we have things we'd like to talk to you about, but most important is what information do you want? I feel like we need a drum roll here. Okay, is okay. Because the sharing is always really fun because you can never see what you're actually sharing to everybody. All right, you just tell me when to forward the slide and I will be your arrow pusher. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Lisa. And Tanya, you chime in wherever uh, you think that there's um, some context or something else you want to um, emphasize, but I'll just kick it off. Uh, so basically, this is. Um, us kind of talking a little bit about uh, the political landscape, the policy landscape, the technological landscape uh, as it comes to energy decarbonization and how we are going to deliver energy to uh, our residents of, of the community and, and the state at large and what is really happening in uh, the energy industry right now, which is a time, shall we say, of real change. So I guess, uh, Lisa, if we could go to the first slide. Okay, before we really go too, too uh, deep into this, I like to kind of get an, um, a ground set, kind of set the stage ground folks about who Northwest Natural is and what we actually provide. And this is my assistant. <laughs> he will not be doing that again. Um, so we provide energy to about 2.5 million Oregonians, uh, about half the state's population. Our territory ranges from the gorge uh, to Astoria and then down the coast past Newport, the valley uh, metro area and the valley past Eugene. And for all of that, um, that territory on any given day, uh, our co company provides about 74% of the space and water heat in our region. And on a, a peak morning or a really cold morning, which is how we design our systems to be able to take uh, to function, uh, we would we could provide up to about 90% of the energy for space and water heat in our region. If you want to put that in some context, if you replaced all gas equipment this minute with electric and, and used hydro to power them, at the highest efficiency, you would need double the hydro we have now. At average efficiency, you could need up to triple. Or another way to think about it is replacing our load with solar panels. You'd have to cover all of Multnomah County in solar panels. And that's the kind of energy that Northwest Natural provides. We do that for about 6% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. So we feel that's a pretty big workhorse with a pretty modest profile. Now. The next, we'll go to the next slide because this is the, this is probably the most important part. Uh, that six percent may be modest, but.
but we are not satisfied with that. We know um, we're not going to argue about climate change as a company. We accept that there's a climate imperative, a climate emergency, and that we need to do all that we can to lower the carbon intensity and the greenhouse gas emissions of our product. And the nice thing is we have a very modern system that we can leverage. And by that, I mean, you hear about systems in the East Coast maybe being leaky or having other issues. In, 1990, in the 1990s, we finished replacing all of our bare steel and cast iron in our system. So it is a complete poly and coated steel system. <clears throat> the reason that matters is because some of the gases that we're going to start transporting or mixing in with a conventionally sourced natural gas uh, are smaller. And it's very important that we have, you know, as few fugitive emissions or leaks on our system as possible. Um, basically, the idea is uh, two out of three Oregonians rely on natural gas for heating their homes. And we really need to work on leveraging that system that people have depended on with different things in the system. Very similar to how um, as the electric grid has gotten greener, adding more solar and more wind, they didn't cut down the wires and put new wires up. They just changed what was going over them. We're doing the same thing with the gas system. So we'll go ahead to the next one, please. Okay, and uh, before I go on, are there any questions? Feel free to get, shout out, raise your hand, put it in the chat. I just wanna, that's kind of our grounding of where we go from here. That's where we are. This is kind of a picture of where we're going. And the thing, uh, we kind of call this our SimCity slide. It really shows how the gas system of tomorrow, today and tomorrow, is going to be very different than maybe the gas system today. Uh, the most important, it starts with very deep energy efficiency. And by that, I mean, we keep we need to keep working on codes, um, building codes, making sure that we are building the most efficient homes. We have to really make sure that we have funding for um, energy trusts to be able to offer incentives for people to retrofit current homes. Um, because you don't have to decarbonize that atom or that molecule that you're not using. So it starts with the deep energy efficiency. But additionally, we're going to be using new uh, methods of collecting natural gas instead of just sourcing it from uh, ways we have in the past. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this, but it'll be focusing on renewable natural gas and hydrogen. And the kind of the neat thing for folks in uh, rural parts of the country uh, or our, our territory is that some of this RNG that is uh, used to be a problem for a farmer, say like a dairy lagoon or some, um, you know, crop, um, some things that they weren't able to use in their crops, we're able to aggregate that, meaning bring it together. And as that decays, you're gonna find uh, renewable natural gas or methane will be coming off of that. And it is basically the same as the, what we get conventionally out of the ground. So it's gonna allow other opportunities for regions that have not participated in the clean energy economy to use what used to be waste stock for them and have it become a revenue stream. And so you're going to see things like you're going to see renewable electricity creating hydrogen, which is on our system. You're going to see renewable natural gas from farms, from wastewater treatment plants. It's going to be stored for later. And that's one of the greatest things about um, our current system is it's really a battery. Uh, you think about batteries for electricity, they last for, you know, they can hold that extra electricity for hours, maybe a day. Well, our system, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is a, a large battery. If you can generate um, hydrogen and store it on our system and use it, like let's say you store it in the spring, you can use it in the fall. So that's it's really kind of exciting some of the things that are happening. We'll go to the next slide and we'll talk a little more about some of these um, new things. So when I first started doing these presentations, this uh, slide I think had 113 projects. And currently you can see in operation under construction and plan, there's over 500. And you know, one thing I will say about America is when there is a proof of concept in the market that pencils out and works well and is, is a moneymaker, you're going to see more of them. And I think that that is exactly what you're seeing here. So these are renewable natural gas um, projects. And basically what that means is anything that has carbon in it, when it decays over time, it releases methane and it will release that methane 
for 24 hours a day. So what we can do, kind of like I've talked about before, is you can aggregate that or bring those waste stocks together, capture that uh, renewable natural gas, clean it to pipeline quality standards, meaning you're taking out any moisture or any um, solids, anything like that, and then you can put it on our system. The nice thing about this, about in 2017, uh, Oregon Department of Energy uh, con commissioned a study to figure out how much technical potential for renewable natural gas there is. And they determined that there was about, in any given year, there would be about 48 billion cubic feet of renewable natural gas. Now, to put that in context, our customers use about 50 billion cubic feet. Um, so basically, it, do, it does show tech in technical potential that there is enough renewable natural gas, gas to supplant what we can buy from uh, Williams Pipeline. Now, are we going to get all of that in every given year? No, we're not. But let's say we got half of it. The nice thing about that, it is replacing, uh, it's a renewable resource for our region. We would be uh, harvesting it here, and we would be able to use it here, and that basically stops that gas from like um, you may have driven by a wastewater treatment plant and seen a stack where it's flaring uh, instead of flaring that you're reusing that at the burner tip and that's you know a pretty important and pretty uh, cyclical thing that we would like to see more used in our area i see dan has your he's a hand raised dan what talk to us Thank you, and I appreciate that. Um, I notice on the map, I don't I know if you can uh, speak to the locations of the two in Oregon and Washington. Are those the Arlington and Roosevelt landfills? I know that Roosevelt has gas recovery. And then second to what you just mentioned about municipal systems, um, is that effective at uh, smaller municipalities or do you need to be in a larger metro area to make that type of recovery cost effective? Um, it, they're medium to larger scale ones. Some of the projects there that I know of is currently we have the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant with the city of Portland. That is one of the larger projects. Additionally, I believe the um, municipal system down in Eugene is also uh, connected to our system. Uh, it may be one of the landfills up in um, up in that you spoke to, uh, but right now we're also in negotiations to uh, be able to create a project with clean water services out in Washington County. <clears throat> and the one thing I, I didn't talk too much about, but it's it's really important. In order to do this, as Northwest Natural, we are regulated by our Public Utility Commission, and one of the stipulations is that our gas buyers, when they go out to the market to purchase the commodity that we're going to send to our customers, they have to buy what we call least cost gas. And right now, RNG is usually not going to be the least cost. Um, this is still an emerging market. We are uh, kind of coming to scale. So it's not the cheapest thing. So what we did is we went to the state legislature and we uh, got some legislation passed called Senate Bill 98. And that basically allowed the Public Utility Commission to allow Northwest Natural to purchase renewable natural gas on behalf of our customers, even if it's not the least cost. And um, at this point, uh, it goes in increments. So from uh, the beginning of the legislation, which was about 2020, to now or to 2025, we're able to buy 5% of the amount of gas that we have on our system can be renewable natural gas. In addition, it'll as we go through the years, we're able to add increasing increments. Um, and to put that in perspective, I believe by the end of the year, we're close to having between two to 3% of renewable natural gas on our system or in development. And the thing that's kind of exciting about that, that's in you know two and a half, three years. And if you look at the um, solar and wind uh, industry, they now account between anywhere between seven and 11% each of the energy uh, on the electric grid. And that's taken a couple decades and billions of dollars of subsidies. So we're really trying to be strategic about this. Part of what that Senate Bill 98 also allows us to do is it allows Northwest Natural to invest in projects to help them come to fruition. Um, so we are able to have more of those projects coming online, bettering the technology and hopefully driving the cost down. So does that help? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. 
Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And then the other thing that uh, we know is going to be part of our uh, decarbonization plan will be hydrogen. And, you know, a methane molecule is basically a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms surrounding it. And there are differing ways you can get pure hydrogen. Um, one of probably the least expensive ways right now would be to take that methane molecule that's conventionally sourced natural gas or could be renew renewable natural gas. What you do with that is you basically strip the carbon atom out and you either sequester it in the ground or you create another product that leaves you with the hydrogen and that hydrogen can be used on our modern system. And I know people think, oh, that's either niche or it's, it's way far out there. Actually, places like Hawaii Gas has been using a mix of hydrogen and conventionally sourced methane for many, many years. We see it in European uh, countries, uh, especially Denmark is one, probably one of the leaders in this technology. And right now, we have a couple projects going on our system. Uh, our Sherwood Resource Center, similar to what ta where Tanya works, uh, it's a little bit larger and we have a kind of a tiny village there that we do training with our first responders. And that little village is isolated and it, it allows us to run different mixtures of gas into those uh, homes and see how it affects our valves and our pipe and any equipment. So the key thing is we're really being thoughtful about uh, the blends of this and how it is going to affect our system. And we know that up to about 20%, you can mix uh, hydrogen, pure hydrogen with our conventionally sourced natural gas, and there is no effect in your downstream appliances. So that's really an exciting thing. The other thing I talked about it a little bit at the beginning, in the spring, when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and the hydro uh, turbines, there's just a lot of water. Uh, the electric grid sometimes has to idle those turbines. They have to uh, depower their solar panels because there's just too much electricity being generated. You can take that excess electricity and you can run it through a water bath and take use that electricity to split those water molecules, giving you hydrogen and oxygen. And that's what we call green hydrogen, which is really the holy grail of, of the hydrogen because there's absolutely no emissions from that. And uh, it's using kind of a use it or lose it. You're, you wouldn't be able to use that electricity really for much else because the grid is full. So we're taking that and we're creating hydrogen, which we can then store on our system and use when uh, things are needed. And right now in our Sherwood system, our Sherwood uh, Resource Center, we've, we've got this pilot program. And at any time, if someone is, is curious about them, we do uh, on a monthly and sometimes quarterly basis, we'll do tours to kind of show people what we're doing. And the key thing I, I think is important about this is we know this is a technology that's gonna be needed, but we wanna be very thoughtful and very safe and really um, do this in the right way. So we're taking our time to make sure that we know how it affects our system and how to do it right. And it's kind of the beginning of the scale up of our hydrogen production, and it's pretty exciting. We'll go to the next slide. And I see, Dan, you have a question about obsidian H distribution concept. I wished I knew what that was. And um, I'm happy to have you tell me, but I just, I would say that there is a lot going on in the hydrogen space. I mean, I talked about uh, different colors of hydrogen. We have also a turquoise hydrogen um, project that's going. And basically what that does is it strips that carbon atom out and it leaves it as carbon black. So think of it as kind of like the graphite shavings of a pencil. And we can then take that carbon black and go ahead and, and put it in asphalt or in uh, as a in tires, different things like that. So it's taking that carbon and sequestering it in a different way in the built environment. But Dan, do you, did you have more context on that? I do. It's a hydrogen distribution pipeline concept. It's concept level right now, but it's going into uh, Eastern Oregon. There was a presentation at um, Columbia Gorge Renewable Energy Zone. I've got an overview paper and I'll drop it in the chat box to you. Um, Thank you. Again, concept level only. Uh, but it terminates in the Dalles, so it's something that we're tracking here. You know, and that that is um, 
I will say this right now, the energy industry is a little bit the Wild West. You're going to see, we're seeing lots of innovation, lots of different um, different programs, different pilots, and it's exciting. And the key thing is we want to, you know, kind of help the market figure out which one of those are most cost effective, which one of those are, you know, uh, have the best return on investment, and which can be replicated without other um, unintended consequences or other waste streams that um, are something that we have to deal with. So it, that's very much is the wild west. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as a regulated utility, uh, we are pretty staid and steady and true. That's because we're regulated. One thing we have done to participate in uh, a little bit more of this Wild West area is uh, we are actually a Northwest Natural Holding Company. And under the holding company, there's our gas company. We also have a water company, but we have also formed a uh, renewables company at, that operates only on shareholder dollars. And that company is allowed to, um, because they are just uh, basically funded by our shareholders, they're able to uh, investigate and participate in some of these more um, I would say avant-garde or, or cutting edge projects. So I think though it's really exciting that we have that to be able to help move some of these projects from, or these um, ideas from concept, which we wouldn't want to spend ratepayers dollars on to reality uh, that is at market scale. So that's, I mean, and there are many other companies uh, working in this space. So there will be a lot of things that, uh, come to the top and some of them will work and some of them will won't, but it's pretty exciting to watch the, uh, the landscape evolve. So this next slide kind of talks a little bit about if Northwest Natural is really committed to doing all these things, uh, why aren't you just doing them? What's the problem? What's the holdup? There are still a lot of challenges um, and there are a lot of people who frankly don't believe that there's a future for uh, natural gas or for that matter, our system in the future. And part of that stems from a lot of what I would call misinformation or the conception, misconception that uh, electrification equals decarbonization. And, you know, some folks talk about, oh, you know, we just get rid of the gas system and we'll electrify everything. Well, um, I think if you see, if you want to do with some investigation there, the um, integrated resource plan for some of the, the uh, investor owned utilities, they really do show that there may be some shortfalls coming up uh, on energy period and B, especially if you're trying to do it with all renewable energy, the variability and the increased use from cars uh, to, you know, to power cars really is going to be a challenge for them. And in that case, when there isn't enough uh, electricity that they are generating either through natural gas at 40% efficiency or with renewables, they have to go on the market and purchase it. So there are scenarios that we've modeled that if you get rid of our system, you could affect effectively raise um, greenhouse gas emissions in a particular region. I see Matthew, you have a question. Yeah, I actually was wanting to ask you, I was waiting until you kind of got to the, the automobile part. Um, you know, I've, I followed a little bit, but I've always been curious, what is Northwest Natural or are you guys looking at ways? I mean, everybody talks about electric vehicles, um, but I know that there's some companies, I know Hyundai, I know Toyota have already looked at investing in hydrogen based cars. I mean, what, how is Northwest Natural facilitating that type of research into making that more of a reality because it is a renewable resource um, that is, you know, in my opinion, obviously way cleaner than uh, electric and or even gas at this point. Well, and I, I would say when it comes to the transportation uh, arena that we're very pro um, go ahead. We, I think you saw that that chart at the beginning where it showed we were 6% of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. We know, I think it said that 36% of the greenhouse gas emissions in our state are transportation. That slide or that that bar might be a little bit out of date because it's closing on 40% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions are from uh, transportation. And so we're just very pro, let's do things right now to reduce that amount. And over time, the market will figure out other uh, technologies that are either uh, less expensive or more efficient. Um, we think that the uh, 
integration of more hydrogen projects into our system uh, will help the market find where uh, where it makes sense to to be in transportation. I do I do know that um, marine and aviation are probably two of the areas that they rely on diesel and not um, conventional uh, gasoline. Those are probably two of the areas that will benefit from hydrogen most. Uh, but I do think that over time, you will see other uh, technologies come into transportation. Northwest Natural is basically working on decarbonizing our system, getting more RNG projects and helping the hydrogen um, generation or the hydrogen creation uh, come to scale. So we're not too um, in the nuts and bolts or in the weeds with transportation. Does that help? It does. Thank you. I think on uh, this one too, Nina, it might be worth saying that in our metropolitan area, our, our crew vehicles run off of natural gas. They don't do that out here because we don't have a fueling station, but in the larger territories uh, where there's a lot more population and more DEQ issues and so forth than we, than we have out here, uh, they run off of the natural gas system. And so in that sense, it's, it's having less carbon emissions because of the way we're doing it there. Um, so, and, and then just the thought that the natural gas system and using that for the fueling is best for, um, you know, short-term route type vehicles, which out here in our area, again, could be challenging uh, because, you know, UPS might have three hours, one direction, one way, and it, it just doesn't work as well in the rural areas because we don't have the fueling stations. But in the metro area, it's definitely something that uh, we do as a company, but yeah, just backing up the electrics for now. And I would say that kind of like Tanya just said, a lot of our um, trash haulers will have uh, natural gas vehicles. Additionally, one of the things that was kind of exciting is um, we had a pilot with Hylion and it was a uh, natural gas with a battery backup uh long haul or semi and it was basically for things like concrete trucks and uh, cement trucks things like or things like in that realm heavy haul that would return to base that the electric uh, motors just didn't have the horsepower to do and we are we're thinking that that and maybe even potentially um some construction vehicles uh, because we know that that's that's been a concern but there it would be a compressed natural gas with a uh, an enhanced uh, battery on them to to do some of that uh, short duration or or return to base kind of work. So I do think that that is the place we may play uh, a little bit, but it would not be on the hydrogen side yet. It would still be on the compressed natural gas side. But so back to the this challenges here, we really would like this work to go quickly and to have everybody rowing in the same direction on both the electric grid decarbonization and the gas grid. But we really have, um, we have a lot of headwinds against us. It's a lot of misinformation. Um, it's easier to target one company as a fossil fuel company and how that we should just get rid of them uh, because we are 6% of the state's emissions. It's We're a company. It's easier to demonize one company rather than to do the heavy lifting about, like if you think about the transportation sector, that's 40% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. And that to really solve or crack that nut, it's going to require a lot of uh, infrastructure investment and a lot of personal decisions from you and I to change from what we currently drive to, you know, an electric car. So it's easier to, you know, find one villain than to, to uh, work on a, um, a sector that's going to require a lot of individual decisions. Again, people don't, aren't focusing on the resiliency. I, I know uh, you guys might have faced this, but for us, uh, we had in the last couple of years, a couple of weeks that larger parts of the metro area, Clackamas County for one, were without power for two, you know, anywhere from two days to three weeks. And that's where the natural gas system really shines because it's cold. And if people have natural gas, depending on the equipment they have, they can still cook. They can heat their, uh, you know, a living space with their natural gas uh, fireplace. And depending on the equipment, I, as I said, they can take hot showers. And and to me, it's not even just like the, the hot water aspect, but having a stove that you can use in a power outage, uh, your wastewater, your water treatment plants only work for so long uh, on their generators. And you may have a boil water notice. If you have no power, 
and you are in a boil water notice, uh, you can't even do that. So I, I do think having two energy systems really does help the resiliency of our region. And, um, you know, a lot of our jurisdictions uh, have, I would say, a vocal minority of folks that really are dogmatic about, they think it's only electrify everything and that's the way it should be. And we are really working with our jurisdictions trying to serve on climate action uh, task forces, uh, making sure that there is um, a voice for energy choice. Yeah, Cascadia event 300 years and counting, I know. And that's gonna, that's probably gonna put a lot of our issues in real perspective as we deal with that. But so we're facing a lot of headwinds to do this good work. Uh, that's why we're doing more of, if you go on to the next slide, we'll talk a, a little bit about more why we're doing this. You know, Northwest Natural has been in our, your community for a long time. And we're really good at what we do, frankly. We put in pipe, we maintain pipe, we deliver energy, and we're real quiet about it. And I think that that, while it's admirable, has possibly worked to our detriment, because if you aren't creating and talking about your narrative, other people create it for you. And I think that there has been a lot of groundswell of people providing misinformation about uh, our company, our product, and our efforts to decarbonize. And so that's why we're, we're trying to be really much more intentional about our outreach to folks like you. Uh, we started in this last year to do a territory-wide customer uh, education and engagement. We um, have been doing many more of these types of presentations, communicating with our customers, offering them information, uh, invited them to learn about our vision 2050 to uh, become a carbon neutral gas utility and increase their energy knowledge. They could complete a survey that would uh, cause them to get some updates about what we are doing and really we're stepping up our communication with our communities, with our business leaders like you, and with our customers. And what's encouraging is, you know, in doing this, we have we've done some polling, and we know that there's really broad support, uh, despite what you may see in the media or what you may hear at certain council meetings. Seventy-four percent of our um, voters really value the gas system. They want our local governments to work with us alongside the our electric brethren to decarbonize, provide new new uh, new technologies, new uh, fuels to decarbonize. And most importantly, people believe that they should have a choice of what they use uh, to power their homes for and and to take care of their families. So it's it's been really interesting. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of misinformation to to uh, correct, but uh, we also need to have folks like you stepping up in your community, serving on climate action plans, being engaged with your elected officials, and making sure that people know what, you know, what is important to you. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so this is kind of talking a little bit about more of our efforts. Uh, we've done a lot of participation in Climate Action Task Force. I think I sit on five of them at this point. And uh, that's really important because you need to, when your uh, staff in our local jurisdictions a lot of times doesn't have deep expertise in these, uh, these arenas. Heck, I barely uh, understand half of it and I do it every day. Uh, so it's really important that when we provide data that uh, decisions are gonna be made on, both staff and consultants understand the data. It's also uh, important for them to understand what is going on on a federal and state level that will affect the climate action plans that they're creating. Uh, for instance, one of the climate action plans I had been sitting on, uh, they had done a bunch of modeling about what they needed to do to decarbonize. And I asked them, well, you realize that under the governor's executive order, we have a climate protection plan in place that requires us to decarbonize like 90% by 2045. And they were like, oh, we didn't know that. And I'm like, well, that's probably pretty important in your modeling because right now we are regulated to reduce, I and mean, we don't even have a choice. Even if we didn't want to do this work, uh, we wouldn't have a choice. And they're like, oh, so that really matters. And it, it's important for us to be able to help staff 
And then as the, in the next column, you see the, the climate consultant education. It's important they understand our gas system, what we're really trying to do, and that uh, how they are using the data that we give them to make sure they're creating viable uh, policies that are in line with the regulations that we current have, currently have. And then really doing more um, policy education with folks like you, with our leaders, uh, elected leaders, to make sure folks understand and we can take feedback from what they are uh, seeing or what they may want as well. So I've been talking a lot here. I think I have one more slide and then I'd love to have some more just open dialogue. Uh, this is one little thing that I think is important to talk about. I talked about energy efficiency earlier and um, another one of the executive orders was having a what they called a rebuild task force. So it took a lot of folks in the housing industry and engineering and in codes work. And we sat on the rulemaking advisory committee to um, look at Oregon building codes to, to determine where some, central, some essential changes might need to be to make sure that we're always pursuing more efficiency. And probably the largest one that came out of that was uh, that all now HVAC equipment must be inside conditioned space, which means heated space. It can't be out in the garage, that an unheated garage or up in an attic that's not insulated. And all duct systems must be inside that conditioned space. So you aren't, uh, so you're increasing the uh, efficiency there. And, and that's the sort of uh, types of things that we're working on along the value chain. It's the codes, it's the energy efficiency, and it, that in hand in hand with the decarbonization strategies for our actual product. But uh, I guess the last thing I want to touch on is uh, bans, gas bans, because I think that most of you have seen that there are uh, many cities in California, some cities in Washington, um, and in fact, uh, the city of Eugene even has uh, passed a ban for natural gas in new construction. However, this uh, earlier this year, the Ninth Circuit or a portion of the Ninth Circuit, which I think we all can admit is probably not seen as the bastion of conservatism, uh, looked at the Berkeley uh, decision and overturned it, basically said that, it, that a city could not mandate what kinds of equipments. That was a federal government um, action or, or um, that is their purview. And so I think that that has really kind of put the brakes on some cities pursuing these gas bans. Additionally, with the city of Eugene, I know that they're kind of weighing what that Berkeley decision means and if it's going to go to the full Ninth Circuit or if it's going to be um, asked to see, be seen uh, in front of the Supreme Court. But in addition, when the city of Eugene uh, did uh, pass their ordinance to ban natural gas and new construction, uh, a coalition was formed and within 30 days they were able to collect 13,000 signatures to refer the issue to November's ballot. So I, I think that that kind of does show you that people uh, people want to do the right thing for the environment, but they want to have real discussion and they want to have choice. So that we will we will see kind of what uh, if, if there are ripple effects from Ber the Berkeley decision and uh, what happens with the Eugene ban. But we our goal is in providing information like this and being willing partners that cities will be able to work with us to A, achieve their climate goals, but B, in an affordable and efficient way, be able to maintain energy choice for their residents. So that's pretty much all I got to say. I mean, I'm happy to take questions. Um, this is the last slide there. It talks about, I talked about new technologies. We will see by the end of this year, uh, gas heat pumps uh, entering the market. And we work with our HVAC uh, in contractors and our suppliers to when a new piece of technology arrives on the market, we like to make sure that we pilot these things. And if they're really, uh, if they are what they are cracked up to be or, or they live up to the hype, we really wanna get them into the market and uh, have people know about them and, and feel comfortable installing them. And these are pretty exciting because it's basically a heat pump, but it's got a back, gas backup. So it operates on heat pump efficiency or in uh, as a normal heat pump would be until uh, temperatures get, you know, basically to about 40 degrees where most heat pumps then just resort, res resort to resistance heating. So it will be exciting to see these come into our communities and to see how installers and builders uh, incorporate them or, or, or the kind of the, how well they're adopted, but we're going to work pretty hard on that.
So uh, like I said, all done here. Love to chat with, uh, have more questions. I know you have Tanya as a resource every day, but I'm happy to take uh, any other questions or if there's areas that people are curious about that I didn't cover, happy to chat. Tanya, does that mean we did so good that no one has questions or they're all asleep? <laughs> it looks like, it looks like Matt has another one. Thank you for saving me here, Matt. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious, um, again, go back to some of the technology changes. Um, you know, obviously, when we talk about green energy, like solar panels seem to be the big thing for home use. And you just brought up, you know, the HVAC world as far as natural gas and already where you know some of the other options um you know are you guys seeing a lot of options being you know we'll say designed or created for homes that maybe want to go full off grid if you will you know not use standard electricity but go full solar and or use um you know obviously during winter at night you know uh hydrogen and or natural gas based generators to supplement, you know, uh, the solar option, you know, when it's not feasible or available. Well, you know, I think you're seeing folks do all of the above. And um, when I talk about our system, please don't think I don't believe in rooftop solar or EVs uh, in, you know, charging in, in homes. I think we're going to need to do all of the things. We're, we have more people, we have more cars, we have more houses, we're going to need more energy. And the key thing is we need to find ways to source that energy that is the greenest and, and the most uh, respectful to the environment. So I think we're going to need to do all those things. One thing that is pretty interesting, I know that you're hearing people talk about, oh, I'm going all electric in my home and that's fine. But an interest that we are finding, at least in the metro area, is uh, our HVAC folks are putting in uh, gas generators for folks. So when the power goes out, they have their gen gas generator that flips on and is able to power portions of their home. So I think you're going to see lots of different things happening and I assist in. Um, I, I think that it's great. I mean, that the market usually will determine what uh, technologies work best and what people like, but I think we need to have opportunities for people to make choices. Well, and on on that, Matt, just out of just just a little quick note about uh, personal experience here. Uh, since I live local, is I I looked into solar panels and uh, because I live outside of the Dalles, outside of Dufer, as you guys know, and uh, I have a co-op is my electric company. And so what happened when I called the solar company, they would not once they found out my solar could not be subsidized because of there's not net metering with Wasco Electric, they would no longer even discuss the matter with me or give me a quote because they said it would not be cost effective for me to do that. So A, you know, it was highly disappointing. B, I had a conversation with Wasco Electric and because they're a co-op, they've already maxed out their ability for net metering. And so they don't have to take any more net metering. So I would either have to just, it, so there was really, either just pay all the money out. And, and in that sense, I kind of defeated the purpose because I wasn't gonna be gaining other than my self-sufficiency. So for me, it made more sense to just do a generator that I could have on the side, which would be more cost-effective than, um, and I pay a lot for electricity out where I'm at. Uh, we're really fortunate in the PUD territory, it's half of what I pay out at Wasco Electric's territory. So. Uh, you know, that was disappointing for me, someone in the energy industry that understands how this works, and I can't even find um, additional resources out where I live in a rural community if, to make my system more resilient. So um, I think it just, it, it adds to the fact that the peak load available in the gorge that we, that we handle as a natural gas uh, provider, the utilities here cannot currently they they're not sized to take on our peak load during the middle of winter and i've had conversations with the pud engineer about that they're like gosh if they ban you guys i don't know that we could take you on we'd have to build more infrastructure i'd need to know what that is uh, and, and it's just it's system-wide so it's it versatility and uh, resiliency is definitely the advantage with having the two sources 
Well, and I just speak to, um, like you said, it's always interesting. My parents actually lived in a full off-grid house. The only quote unquote utility they had was here over in Hood River, the upper valley is all the water rights are owned by Crystal Springs. So we couldn't, you know, they couldn't drill well, but they had solar, wind, hydro generation, um, all on site. Um, they had a washing machine um, and their dryer was LP based. And again, where they were at, they didn't have access to natural gas. So all of their gas, you will say was all LP based. Um, but it's an interesting concept, obviously, like, you know, you see like Generac is pretty common. Um, and I even worked in the um, electrical side as a, you know, a electrician for a little bit early on, um, you know, and we used to install generators and looking at generators, looking at, um, you know, thermal systems for heating houses, um, you know, all of that stuff. So it's always been an interesting concept to me. But again, as people kind of push towards this, I agree with you, Nina, it's, it's going to take everything. It is going to take hydro. It is going to take electric. It is going to take natural gas or hydrogen or, or whatever the case may be to, um, you know, make these things happen. And I guess that would be a question too, is, is that, you, you know, you said it's obviously what the market bears, but also, you know, as people move into the gorge and we are more rural, you know, our options are obviously limited to what we can get. You know, like Tanya mm -hmm. said, you know, we're out there trying to do whatever, whether it's get solar, they want to do it because subsidized. So we got to do it ourselves or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, are you guys seeing a push for rural communities to want to get natural gas? Or, you know, again, like say I live in Parkdale. It's like, I would love to have natural gas in my house. I would so much rather personally, just as a, as a cook, cook with natural gas um, just because I like get so much better for cooking purposes. So Things like that. What are you guys seeing? Are you guys seeing trends of a greater push to expand those services into the rural communities, or are you still limited by, again, what the market can bear? Uh, well, I can probably speak to that here. Just yeah, go out, ahead, please. Out out here where we are, uh, we might get one and two calls, but most people know where we are and where we aren't. So it where the calls really come in is when they're on the edge of our system. And they want it, uh, but then we have to extend gas lines and, and main extensions and, and the way that we're regulated, we don't do that for free. Uh, the customer requesting it has to bear that, that cost because we're not going to put that cost on our existing rate payers. So that's where usually the um, rubber meets the road when it hits the checkbook and they're like, well, as much as I want it, uh, I'm not going to pay for that main extension. Uh, because again, it, it it too can be cost prohibitive. So that's, uh, it, you know, at the end of the day, the checkbook speaks. And um, I wouldn't say that we have towns. I, I, one time Cascade Locks was looking at wanting gas there when they were talking about the casino. That was quite a few years ago. So we were looking into how to get it over to Cascade Locks because we have it in Hood River. Uh, and then we have it at North Bonneville. Oddly enough, Stevenson is served by a Vista, not Northwest Natural. Goldendale served by a Vista, yet we have the old Goldendale aluminum plant that is Northwest Natural. So there's just a lot of uh, odd puzzle places in the gorge. Um, uh, Lyle's another one at one time. People have wanted gas in Lyle, but again, it's a distance thing. And, and at the end of the day, the pocketbook speaks. Well, and I would just add on to that, that right now economic development is uh, a big discussion, uh, especially around um, Intel and the CHIPS Act. And the way I think that this might um, help our rural communities or or create uh, further discussion is I think people in leadership understand, like I think about the city of uh, Malala, they have, or excuse me, Estacada, they have some of the best industrial land in the metro area prime industrial land, zoned, ready to go, everything. Oh, except they lack the infrastructure and services. And for us to be able to put services out to be able to maximize that industrial land, which we all know in the, the metro area is very needed, $20 million. The city of Estacada does not have $20 million. Um, so it's things like the governor's office and looking at federal funds to find um, ways to be able to help these rural communities get that basic infrastructure 
to be able to maximize some of the um, the job opportunities, the land opportunities, uh, the energy opportunities that are out there. So I, I do think that that is a discussion point going forward. But Tanya's right; it's our margins um, that we that we where we are we can grow, uh, but it's pretty darn expensive, and we as a regulated utility, the folks coming on have to bear the brunt of that. And I see it's 8.01, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to undo the mute button. So it is 8.01. Nina and Tanya, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Um, I do have the PowerPoint, so I will gladly share that with you. I appreciate the time, but most of all, I appreciate the passion and the care uh, for all of us in our communities. And Dan, go ahead real quick. Real briefly, I put an invitation to the nursing pinning ceremony June 15th is in the chat box. Thank you. All right. Grab that if you need that. Um, but thank you again. Uh, we will be getting this up to our YouTube and so it'll be able to be viewed. Next Thursday is Oregon Representative Jeff Helfrick. Uh, he will be our guest. And uh, there again, uh, if you go to our YouTube, you can see the past sessions that we've had. So anybody can do that. And thank you and everyone have an amazing day. Tomorrow's first Friday, Saturday's the first farmer's market. We have a crazy fun community. Uh, so be checking those out. It's all on the community calendar, tdcommunitycalendar.com. So there you Thanks, go. Lisa. Thanks everyone.